or John? Get started. I'd like to call the regular full virtual board uh, meeting for the aldermen for May 10th to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, ready? Alderman King? Here. Alderman Stowe? Alderman Adamowski? Here. Alderwoman Tarr? Here. Alderman Cassetti? Here. Alderman Janetti? Here. Alderman Knott? Here. Alderman Yellman? Here. Alderman Rivers? Alderman Mamone? Here. President Short? Here. Alderman Blackwell. Alderman DeLibro. I have 10 present, three absent, and one vacancy. Perfect. I declare a quorum. All right. So we have um, two sets of minutes to approve. Uh, we have the regular meeting last month from April 12th. And we have the minutes that were uh, distributed recently for the May 5th uh, public hearing on the budget. Make a motion to accept both sets of minutes, Josh. Second. Motion to accept by Mamone, second by Cassetti. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? I'll abstain from the uh, April 12th. I wasn't present. I will also. One abstention, two abstentions, uh, Yaman and Tar for the um, April 12th. Got it. Perfect. Thank All you. Right. Public session. Um, I think uh, Mr. Marini will be monitoring this, but uh, as usual, please uh, identify yourself for the public record. Please limit your comments to um, three minutes or pre preferably less. Um, and just a reminder, it's not a Q&A, but we're happy to hear from anybody from the public who would like to address the Board of Aldermen. Okay, Is there Mr. anyone? Petter's hand was up first. Yes. All right. Did it name and name and address for a public record, please. Sure thing. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, John. Uh, John Fetter, 63 Hubble Avenue. Um, I'd like to address the pending purchase and sale of the Olson Drive property. Not really from a position of support or opposition, but to the proposed use of the property, but strictly from a legal standpoint as it applies to the city charter. I first want to thank Corporation Council Marini for his correspondence over the past few months in clarifying the transaction and addressing my concerns. However, after having done some of the research, uh, I and a number of other residents believe that this transaction is violating the city charter in multiple ways. Uh, specifically, I'm referring to Article 20, Section 2-215, Procedure to Sell City Property. This section is very clear about the timelines and processes required by the city when it decides to sell city-owned properties. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole section, but I'll highlight the parts that are pertinent. Um, from time to time, the city may be asked to decide May, may decide to sell property it owns. This property may be a small fraction of land or a full building lot or parcel consisting of several acres. It could also be property containing buildings. This procedure pertains to all parcels of property with or without buildings on it. So the procedure is as follows. A request is received asking this to sell city owned property or the board of aldermen decides to sell city property of significant size. It then goes on from numbers one to six, uh, basically referring to um, getting a favorable 824 referral from PNZ, which I know was done earlier this year. But the true concern in the parts of the section that there are potential charter violations are as follows. Number seven, if the appraised value of the property is $250,000 or higher, the Board of Aldermen must hold a public hearing before deciding to sell and advertising for bids. A public hearing has not occurred even though the city has already decided to sell and has advertised for bids on behalf of the housing authority. By not holding a hearing prior to bid and sale, the city has violated the charter and denied the rights of the residents of Ansonia to speak on the matter. And even if the city were to hold a public meeting now, it would be after the transaction has occurred and not in the spirit nor the wording of the charter. The second potential charter violation is that on number eight, upon receipt of the appraisal, the city would advertise that is it accepting bids no lower than the appraised price or another price agreed to by this board with a cutoff date to receive sealed bids. Now the appraisal being used to value the property was conducted on February 9th, 2021. 
per this part of the section, it's upon the receipt of that appraisal that the bids were to be solicited. This did not occur and per corporation council, despite the requirements set forth in the charter, the city does not intend to solicit bids for this property. To summarize, if the city is to complete a legal transaction, the entire process outlined in section 2-215 must be followed once the sale from the housing authority to the city is complete. And that includes the 824 referral, the public meeting, what? sealed bids, and there the is? bid approval. The procedure thus far does not comply with these regulations. Being that the property is not yet in the city's possession, none of what has occurred to date satisfies the spirit of the charter or the letter of the charter. Yes, the city was well within its rights to act as a broker for AHA in soliciting the bids for Olson Drive, but that does not absolve the city from adhering to the charter once the sale from the housing authority to the city is complete. Make no mistake, courts take charter violations seriously. In fact, only a few weeks ago, the interim chief of police of New Haven was ordered to vacate her position by order of the court due to a charter violation. I strongly urge this board to do their due diligence in addressing the Olson Drive transaction when it comes to the mandates of our city charter. Violations of the charter could result in delays and possible stoppage of the product in its project in its entirety. Again, for those of you on the board who want to do further research, I'm referring to, referring to Article 20, Section 2-215. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else from the public who wishes to speak tonight? Um, oh, Lou Schwartz. Uh, all right. Name and, name and address for the public record, please. Hi. Um, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Not sure who Lou. was being directed. Uh, Lou? Yes, uh, Lou oh. Schwartz, yep. 24 Hillside Avenue. Um, just here to make a uh, ever request of the Board of Aldermen. And that is, I'd like to make a request that something in or around Ansonia High School be named in memory of my two sons, <laughs> Andre, <laughs> Andre Tinney and Brian Schwartz, both deceased tragically young, and both Ansonia High School football standouts. Um, now, I was told I had to write a letter, but I'm just giving this, I guess, as advance notice, or if I could yeah, get some feedback on it now. I was going to say, if you want to send it in, in care of me uh, as the president, I'll make sure that the board uh, receives this. OK, very good. Then, what right. do I have to put in a letter? Uh, whatever, whatever details you, um, whatever you want uh, for consideration. Okay, very right. good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming. You. Uh, the next one has got their hand up, and I don't know. It just says J E. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, Jason Edwards, one sixty six Sunset Drive in Sonia. Um, you know, this has been sort of an issue um, I've noticed coming around. Um, you know going down Main Street, at least, uh, coming home from, uh, you know, Derby Ways. Uh, I work in New Haven, so I come home uh, through Main Street. And I understand that there's a lot of restaurants uh, being built, not built, but incorporated into um, Upper Main Street. And uh, a lot of pedestrians cutting into the street when you're trying to drive up. So I understand that it's a state road and there's a lot of, um, litigation that happens with uh, getting state, you know, projects done on roads such as that, but oh, sidewalks and, you know, warning lights would be greatly considered, especially in front of Mass Minos. Um, there have been multiple times where I go down the road around 7.30, 8.15 at night, and people just walk out in front of the cars and I barely see them. You know, I, I never really come on these, but this is just an issue that I've noticed in the past couple weeks or so. And, you know, the direction of traffic has changed, and so have a lot of people been worried about it, especially me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. I just I'll mention, um, and I'm happy to do this on your behalf, but uh, the, the police department is the local traffic authority. So, um, you know, we can bring that to the, to the police commission uh, for consideration as well. If you want to either contact me or contact your, uh, you know, any alderman, um, and, and we can work, work to uh, at least have those looked at. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else from the public who wishes to address the board tonight? I, I would like to say something. What, can you hear me? Yes. Name okay, my name is my name is Ron Silverberg, and I'm I want to talk for a minute about my father, Pinky Silverberg. We were both Ansonia residents. He was flyweight champion of the world in 1927. 
I wanted to congratulate the city of Ansonia and thank Mayor Cassetti for agreeing to display his world championship belt at City Hall. Um, the belt has been in my safe deposit box for many years and it deserves to see the light of day. And there's no better place than to display this belt than, than his hometown of Ansonia. He, he spent his whole adult life in Ansonia and he passed away in Ansonia. Um, it'd be great because it'll, it'll give all the citizens of Ansonia an opportunity to view the belt. And for that matter, it'll give all the citizens of the Valley an opportunity to view a 95 year old world championship belt. He won the championship in 1927. Um, he won his Connecticut, the Connecticut flyweight championship at the Ansonia Opera House in 1925. And I know that's a subject that's uh, been talked about in Ansonia recently, the, the re re renovating the Ansonia Opera House. He fought there and won the Connecticut championship. He, he won the world championship two days later, two, two months, uh, excuse me, two years later in Bridgeport. That was 1927. He was Ansonia's champion and his belt deserves to be displayed in his hometown. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Silberg, that, that is on the agenda for later in the meeting as well. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see the agenda, so. But thank you. Did, for thank you. Anyone else from the public who wishes to address the Board of Aldermen tonight? Turn around. Second call, anyone from the public who wishes to speak? And third and final call on the public session. Seeing none, we will close the public session and we'll move on to the next item. Uh, the approval of the budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Uh, at this point, I'd like to um, call on um, our finance chair, Tony Mamone, and potentially chief fiscal officer, uh, Kurt Miller as we navigate um, this, we had the public hearing uh, last week um, and, uh, uh, and we've, it's been passed through boat to the mayor, through boat and uh, through the su subcommittee and now to the fu full board. Uh, is Tony here? I'm here. Tony, and you wanna take the lead on this? Sure, okay. absolutely. So good evening everyone, members of the board, mayor, City staff, you know, this, this budget, I, I think, Mayor, as you had started with, this was kind of a, a, a budget that was supposed to suppose or, or add no additional liability onto the residents of this city. So, you know, in terms of, you know, what this budget does, you, you know, if we just go through a simple checkbox list, if you will. So, you know, if we were to say, you know, this budget fully funds all departments, including police, arms, fire, education, check. But this budget does that. This budget also proposes no tax increase to the residents, check. This budget does that. We also continue with a stable mill rate. There's one caveat to that based on what the state did, which we'll discuss a little bit further, but a stable mill rate for an additional year, check. It, this budget also adheres to our capital and long-term plan that Mr. Miller had set up and continues to adhere to and you know, works towards building not only the capital plan, but also the reserve fund that we have. Check, this budget does that. This budget I think hits all the milestones that we were looking for as a city. And just looking at you know, some of the other cities and towns around us who might not have it as good as we do right now, we did pretty well. So just a round of thanks real quick, Mr. Miller, you and the finance staff, fantastic job. Mr. Mayor, phenomenal, as usual, and all of your team. All the department heads that work closely with all the members of finance, fantastic job working. Again, it's not easy, um, you know, trying to be as fair as, as possible, but, you know, we made this happen not only for the, the, the residents, but for everyone in the city. Fantastic job. Um, Josh, so, you know, I want to put forward just a motion, but before I do that, um, Kurt is here, correct? 
I'm here. Kurt, can you just give us, because um, there's going to be a variance in the mill rate with the auto uh, real estate, I'm sorry, automobile taxes. So I just want you just to give a little note on that for, I believe everybody on the board is aware, members of vote are aware, but just for members in attendance, just to hear why exactly we have a variance in that, and then we can move on with our uh, approval. Sure. Um, just as a way of background, one of the charges that both gave when they moved the budget forward uh, to the alderman was to give you the ability to make any corrections or changes uh, that may arise. Uh, we did have some uncertainty over the last couple of months as to what the state of Connecticut would do with regards to the mill rate on motor vehicles. Um, at basically the 12th hour, um, they went and voted to change the, the maximum mill rate that any community in Connecticut could charge. And that reduced that to 32.46. So to uh, Chairman Mamone's point, we uh, had submitted a budget and moved forward a budget that had 37.8 mills. So we had to make those adjustments. Now the changes uh, that you'll see is an actual reduction in the amount of net tax revenue. Uh, that number has decreased by about 738,000. Uh, that is money that we expect uh, will be replaced uh, directly by the state of Connecticut uh, through a grant that they will be uh, giving us. Um, they are titling that, and of course I had it, um, they, they're calling it a municipal transition grant. Uh, the initial indications that we got um, from both CCM and uh, from the state itself is that we would get about three hundred, uh, excuse me, about six hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, that would give us a shortfall. Uh, however, we were assured by uh, our state delegation uh, through email, and I know all of you are on that email, uh, that we would be made whole by the state of Connecticut. So we are moving forward uh, with that. Uh, and that is how we've got to the reduced mill rates on motor vehicles. Just to clarify then, in all previous years, we had one mill rate for property and, and car. And this that is, is correct. This is the That's first year that we have them separated out. So Tony, right. we'll need obviously two motions for the two mill rates. Yep. Yep. Yep, so you'll have one mill rate for motor vehicles and one mill rate for uh, real estate and personal property. Okay. Kurt, thank you for that. Members of the board, do you have any questions on that? No. Okay. All right. So, Josh, with that, I would like to make a motion to vote on the consolidated budget calling for individual motions on revenue, overall revenue, overall expense, motor vehicle mill rate and the personal property and real estate tax mill rates as four individual motions. So I'd like to make that motion to consolidate the budget down into those four individual motions that I'll call off afterwards. We've done this in the past and I would like to move forward with that same process. So that's my motion. I second. second. The motion by Mamone, second by Gennetti to approach this as one big um, consolidated one piece budget. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. So, um, motion carries on that. Okay. Now, do you want to attack the uh, individual pieces? Of course. So, give me a moment. I am going to present. This piece of it. Let me know when folks can see if you guys are good to go. Yep. All right. So the first motion is around city revenue. I'd like to make a motion to accept the 22 23 final year budget in the amount of city revenue $60,693,930. I'll second. Motion by Mamone, second by Tar. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right, motion carries unanimously on revenues. Thank you for that. 
I'd like to make a motion to accept the 2022-2023 final year budget for city expenditures in the amount of $60,693,930. Second. Motion by Mamone, second by Gennetti. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. All right, motion carries unanimously again on the expenditures. Perfect. Moving on to our mill rates. As was noted by Mr. Miller and myself earlier, we are going to vote on the split mill rate. So the mill rate for motor vehicle taxes capped at the 32.46, as noted by Kurt is displayed. So I would like to make a motion to accept the 22, final year 2022-2023 motor vehicle mill rate to be 32.46 mills. I'll second. second. Motion by uh, Mamone, second by Yaman. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? All right, motion carries unanimously. And then the secondary piece of the mill rate as discussed, you know, is the real estate and property tax, uh, personal property tax, um, <laughs> excluding the motor vehicle as we've just voted. So I'd like to make a motion to accept and approve the unchanging mill rate of 37.80 for the 2022-2023 final year budget for the city of Ansonia. Second. Motion by Mamone, second by Not. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion carries unanimously again. I do have, um, I think, Josh, when I was looking back at prior years, I believe we did approve the tax revenue as a whole. So as a precautionary step, okay. um, I'm going to modify and include a fifth motion. And that motion is to um, just note and accept the net tax revenue for the 2022-2023 budget for the city of Ansonia is $38,279,718. Second. Uh, motion by Mamone, second by Rivers. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Abstentions. Motion carries unanimously. All Mr. Right. President, that concludes my motions. Um, everybody, again, thank you for all of your time, energy, and efforts on this budget. Um, if we could frame it and hang it up, I do believe it is a masterpiece. <laughs> Mr. Miller, thank you. All right. Can you um, stop sharing? Oh, there you I go. Will. I Perfect. will. And is, that a, is that a locked safe behind you? Where I keep all my secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small safe. But... Uh, Anyhow, I'm an open book, you. Mr. Short. Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for your efforts on that as, as our uh, Board of Aldermen Finance Chair. Thank you to the uh, seven members of the Board of Aldermen Finance Committee, um, who uh, I almost feel like we had an easy job because the um, uh, the product that came to us was was in pretty good shape. Thank you to to Boat, the Mayor, Finance Team, and everyone that that uh, contributed to that. But mostly to the um, the department heads who worked so collaboratively with with the finance department to to get it to this point so uh you know so well so a lot of a lot of team players um thank you that's a wrap on that all right on uh, moving on we have public official session mayor cassetti good evening everyone president short members of the board of aldermen residents of the great city of ansonia it's good to see you all, even if it's from my computer screen. We are holding tonight's meeting out of an abundance of caution, given the spike in the COVID cases that disrupted the city government in Derby just a couple of weeks ago. However, I am very hopeful that, you, that we will be seeing uh, each other face to face again next month. First, I would like to make, take a moment of silence for the passing of public works employee and fire chief from 2007 to 2009 in the city of Ansonia, my friend, Richard Vallejo. Rich was an incredible guy 
genuine, funny, and always there to lend a helping hand. He will be greatly missed. Thank you. Please let's keep Rich's family in our thoughts and prayers. Now, spring is officially upon us here in Ansonia, and with it, a lot of positive activity on the way. Thanks for voting on the budget for the fiscal year 2022-2023. It holds the mill rate stable while fully funding city services and let, in education and public safety. And let me also include that every department was, was granted what they requested. That's never happened in my term uh, as long as I've been around. So everything, everyone that requested a certain amount from each department, they were given fully funded. It's also a long-term, allows us to plan for improvements like street surveillance and technology to assist our police in fighting crime. A big thanks to the Board of Apportionment and Taxation and this board. It therefore goes without saying that this budget gets my highest recommendation and I look forward uh, uh, to moving forward with the city. Some things to look forward to as we spring into action this month. News on the new multi-sport complex on Olson Drive should be rolling out shortly. Check out our city Facebook page right now to see the latest. Just released renderings. I don't know if you saw them. Ansonia's new senior center is preparing for construction and the position of senior center director will be posted very shortly. We need to get a, 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 a senior center director. We look forward to an amazing fall of programming and activities for our seniors and our residents there. You'll be making a splash at Nolan Field soon. The fighter fighter splash pad will be out to bid in June and should be under construction this fall. So possibly we'll have it for next year because by the time fall gets here, it's too cold to go in that. So uh, it'll be ready for next year. Just wanna let the residents know because I know everybody was looking forward to this year and so was I, but we were waiting for the ARPA funds to come in. So that's why it, it's taken forever. Don't blame it on me. Can't wait to see everyone lying in the streets of our annual Memorial Day Parade. Sunday, May 29th at 2 p.m. Please mark your calendar. Also want to let you know that the Woodbridge Avenue Memorial, that is one of the longest standing memorials in the country, country, the United States of America, Woodbridge Avenue Memorial. That is May 22nd at 2 p.m. up on Vaselli Court in Woodbridge Avenue where the monument is. Hope to see everybody there. Now I want to take a moment to recognize Mike D'Alessio who has officially retired from his post as superintendent of public works. Mike has played such a big part in our mission to recharge Ansonia. The job of public works director is demanding, but Mike rose to the task and is a real working director. Even more important, more important, the respectful, courteous way he treated our residents will be the gold standard from here on out. Thanks to everything, Mike, and if you have some free time in retirement, I promise I'll always have some potholes for you to fill. Enjoy the meeting, everyone. God bless you all. God bless the great city of Ansonia. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right, next up, uh, Corporation Council, John Marini. All right, Mr. President, members of the Board of Aldermen, congratulations on your passage of the 22-23 budget. Great work by all. I want to start off with, of course, recognizing our big milestone. As you already know, the city is now the owner of Olson Drive, and we are continuing to negotiate with the winning bidder on that uh, proposed multi-sport complex. I also want to add a note, um, as this was a, an issue brought up at the beginning of the meeting about the order, right, the chain of events here. It's very important to remember that we're operating under a very specific set of circumstances. The bid needed to be sent first and a proposal needed to be selected. Otherwise, the city would never have been granted approval by HUD, by the federal government to purchase Olson Drive or remove the deed restrictions that limited that property to public housing only. If we were to restart the process and solicit new bids, 
we'd actually be in violation of our agreement with the federal government and we'd be placing the city of Ansoni and housing authority in an understandably difficult situation. Um, this was a specific chain of events um, that may be somewhat different than what would normally happen if we had city property, but absolutely necessary to go forward with the city's purchase and redevelopment of Olson Drive. And of course, this board has been involved in every step of that process. That being said, as I just mentioned prior, uh, the property has not yet been sold to the developer. We're still working on terms, which this board uh, will be uh, apprised of as we go forward. Um, meanwhile, in the city, uh, with contract negotiation, we finished with your help on the Nature Center Rangers. That contract will be uh, finalized and made public soon. And we're moving on to a very significant one, our Ansonia Police Department and police officers. So you'll be presented with more news and details with that next month, but I've already been meeting with both our finance department and Chief Williams on our approach to that contract. Uh, our foreclosure on copper and brass is moving forward. It is pending in the courts. Meanwhile, we're preparing bids for neighboring SHW, which is property that the city already possesses. Sheila's gonna talk a little more about grants that are being prepped, um, ones we've received and ones we're still targeting for that entire property. And we are working out an access agreement with um, the owner of copper and brass the property that is under foreclosure so we could start the remediation process sooner than later. Um, obviously, it benefits the entire city to start as quickly as possible, and we're hoping that the owner will work with the city in good faith to allow that to happen. Um, property owner does owe the city over four and a half million dollars in back taxes, which is the basis for the foreclosure. I want to give congratulations to our new Opera House Committee, uh, the appointments to which uh, are before you tonight. And I also want to update you on our, our recreation situation. Um, the city is uh, putting together a, a regular staff meeting with the various leagues, the mayor, and our recreation and public works staff to give uh, recreation a jump start now that we're coming back from COVID, looking to uh, get a good grip on scheduling, usage of our fields, and overall bolster the strength of youth, uh, youth sports in the city of Ansonia. And for anybody uh, wondering, Colony Park is being surveyed for a repair. We have water runoff issues that are being looked at, and you'll hear likely more about that in the month to come. Um, we're looking to remedy that situation. Um, any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, um, I'll, uh, I'll chime in as we go along with legal issues. Any questions from the Alderman for Corporation Council tonight? All right, you get off easy. Um, next up, Sheila O'Malley, Director of Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Board of Aldermen. Good evening. Um, a few updates for you. On the 35 North Main Street, the SHW site, uh, we had a mandatory bid walk for demolition contractors. Um, they will begin, um, we, on the 25th, the bids are due back. So we anticipate selecting a, a low bidder, low qualified bidder at that time. And they will begin the demolition of building 11, 11A, 11 and 11A, I think that's it for now. Uh, we're doing this in phases in order to keep everything, uh, in, to keep the contaminants um, stable is what the environmental people tell me. So uh, we had about 22 bidders um, and we anticipate a large, uh, a large competitive bid uh, return on the 25th. Also happening on the 25th is the senior center contractors, will, that will be their official start date. Um, it's still a 120 day project from start to finish. It just means the clock starts ticking on uh, on Monday, um, which means most of the equipment has been received and they can begin installing electrical and plumbing and kitchen equipment. On Main Street, we're expecting our new ice cream uh, eatery to be opened uh, this month, end of the end of the month, perhaps. And of course, our scooters. So you could eat an ice cream and drive a scooter down Main Street. Be careful though. 
Um, there's a new development planned for Fountain Lake, not really what we would anticipate for Fountain Lake, but um, should, should prove to be an interesting entertainment um, facility, paintball, et cetera, more to come on that. But I believe site plans um, have been uh, received in the building department. Uh, let's see. The Ansonia Copper and Brass, we, um, at the mayor's direction, I submitted a request for almost $3 million for um, the continuation of work at SHW and at an access road into uh, the parcel to open that up for development. And um, although the, the information is somewhat embargoed, we did, uh, the mayor did announce that um, we believe uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLora will be getting us that, and the entire congressional delegation will be getting us that $3 million for SHW. So we're very grateful um, for that. And, oh, that uh, hurts we're, me. Pretty we're much we're awaiting. Jesus Christ. I thought you had it on them. Hey, Laura, you got to mute yourself. Um, and we are awaiting final uh, determination on that, but um, looks solid and looks like we'll be getting that $3 million. So we can add that to the number of grants we've gotten uh, in the mayor's tenure. Um, I believe that's it for now. Some um, grant applications being submitted. Hopefully we'll get some responses and I'll have some more announcements for you. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, Franklin Street sidewalks, sorry, being designed as we speak, being uh, specs being readied so we can get out to bid this summer. And the splash pad, um, the equipment's been ordered. All the equipment for the park and for the splash pad have been ordered. The specs will be going out for specialty contractors to install and uh, plumbing and electrical. Now that's it. Perfect. Uh, any questions tonight for um, Sheila from the Alderman? Wow, you got off easy too. I sure okay. did. Next Sheila, up. I'll oh, go ahead. Sheila, you, you forgot to say that Josh was going to treat the board for the first round of ice cream when it opens. Correct. <laughs> Excellent. And by the scooters too. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> Chief fin uh, Subcommittee Finance Director Mamone will be. <laughs> Clerging for the uh, scooters, um, but the ice cream will be on me. Uh, um, thank you. Um, let's see. Next up, Kurt, um, Chief Fiscal Officer, Kurt Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good evening to all the board members and the others in attendance. Uh, just a few quick updates on things other than the budget. Uh, we'll begin the test phase of the new time and attendance system with our next uh, pay period. The finance department has volunteered to be the guinea pigs for the test. Um, so we're going to use them to try to uncover any issues or concerns so we can make sure that when we roll this out uh, citywide, everything is up to snuff and, and going well. So once that test phase continues, uh, once that test phase is completed, I should say, uh, we're going to continue rolling it out to the city hall departments. Uh, and once they are fully uh, integrated at that point, we'll roll it out to the library and to the nature center. Our goal is to also include the PD, um, public works and arms, but they each have their own systems. So it's gonna be a matter of just trying to integrate all those together without causing any, any commotion. Uh, the ARPA audit was filed on US Treasury website prior to the deadline. Uh, to date, we have not received any feedback, but I expect at some point uh, that they'll reach out to us in the coming months. Uh, we've taken the time to create uh, all the necessary paper backup files, and we have those stored in finance for easy access uh, should they be needed or requested by the Treasury. Uh, something that I know that the uh, aldermen uh, were very interested in is the uh, abatement uh, with our fire department. Uh, you know, we, we had taken steps to increase that over a two year period, and we were also looking at ways that we can improve uh, the program overall. Uh, we had talked about uh, using some type of investment vehicle for them. So I've been working with uh, one of the city's pension providers uh, to try to come up with some solutions. 
I will be putting them in front of uh, the abatement committee for the fire department, either the second or third week in June. Our plan is to uh, spend a couple months trying to come up with a program that we think will benefit our volunteers, uh, give them the most uh, flexibility, the most bang for the abatement dollars that we're giving them with the hopes of something uh, being ready to go online by July of 2023 at the very latest. So I'll keep you all up to date as uh, we move through that process. Uh, but I know there are a few members of the Board of Aldermen um, that are, will be involved in that process. So again, they'll be kept up to speed as well. So with that, um, I will ask if there are any questions or comments. Any questions from the alderman for Mr. Miller tonight? All right, thanks again to you. Yes, team. yes. Um, uh, Mr. Miller, do, Alderman I, Rogers. do I actually get more than two questions now? Uh, you may have a third question tonight as a special bonus. No, I'm good. <laughs> Oh, you have no questions. Perfect. No, I don't. No, no. I was just, you know, getting them off on them. You know, I figured. Just a long-running, unfunny joke. Perfect. All right, <laughs> moving on. Um. All right. Next up uh, is uh, Lieutenant Pat Lynch. I know that um, Chief Williams is not available, but he did uh, pass on his best wishes and uh, and uh, he did alert us that he was not going to be here. But I think I saw Lieutenant Lynch. Yeah, I did see him. Here. Yes, thank you, uh, President Schuert, and good evening to all the members of the board. Uh, Chief Williams wants me to assure you that he's not trying to avoid all these meetings. Unfortunately, uh, last month he was a little under the weather, and uh, this month he is out of state uh, today, so he's unable to attend. Um, uh, we are moving forward uh, internally with some promotions. Last week at the uh, police commission meeting, Officer Michael Castillo was promoted to detective, and Detective Sergeant James Frolish was promoted to lieutenant. Hopefully at next month's meeting, we'll have a contract uh, for the board to approve for Lieutenant Frolish. We have uh, two officers currently in field training and we have uh, two officers attending the academy at the New Britain Police Department. Um, that's all the uh, news I have to report. I just wanna close out that uh, starting tomorrow, uh, May 11th through May 17th is National Police Week. Uh, May 15th, which is Sunday is National Peace Officers Memorial Day. That was established back in 1962 by President Kennedy. And it's a day to honor all of the officers who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. Uh, last year was a, a very a bad year for police. We had 157 line of duty deaths and an additional 301 COVID deaths. And uh, so far this year, we have had 92 deaths. Uh, I know uh, I speak for the chief when I say uh, we are very much appreciative of the support that the board and the entire city has given us, and we thank you for that. And uh, that is the end of my report. Thank you, Lieutenant, for your work in the department. Any questions um, from the alderman for Lieutenant Lynch tonight? I have one, Chuck. Yep. Go ahead, Bob. Um, Lieutenant, without giving up, without interfering with your investigations how are we doing with the uh shootings that happened in town the hubble avenue homicide we have made great strides and uh, we anticipate making an arrest and uh the uh, last shooting on avon street we have uh, very strong evidence and we have some uh suspects and we're going through the process of linking the suspects to the physical evidence that we were able to recover and how about the West Main Street and Bridge Street shooting? Those are a little more problematic. Um, we do have some physical evidence that's being examined, but at this point, we have no cooperating witnesses. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Any other questions uh, from the alderman? Hey, gosh, I had one. Um, so Mr. Edwards had a comment earlier about, you know, I guess just some folks I don't want to say playing in traffic, but running into traffic. So, Lieutenant Lynch, I don't know if you could comment on that at all. And have you, have, has there been has any any sort of complaints? You know, any any sort of comment on what Mr. Edwards had said? I'm not aware of any complaints to that matter. Uh, we have seen a tremendous increase in traffic due to the uh, reconfiguration of the traffic flow from East Main Street and the uh, opening of the uh, other restaurants. Um, 
we monitor that as best we can. It is a state road, but we can work with the state DOT to get some signage up uh, and try to get uh, maybe a couple more crosswalks put in because I know the crosswalks are probably limited down there. Uh, that's something I will discuss with the chief and the board of police commissioners. Okay. Thank Would you. that need state approval by chance? Do you know? Yeah, it's a state road. So anything, anything we do on the road would need state approval. Uh, the signage, usually they're, they're, they don't concern themselves too much with signage, but anything yep. having to do with the physical roadway, uh, they uh, need uh, to approve it. Yeah, that, that might be beneficial, especially over by the parking lot there, because, you know, to, to Mr. Edwards' point, I have seen, you know, an increased amount of foot traffic folks, you know, either darting out or, you know, crossing over. So thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, any other questions from the alderman? All right, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, sir. Um, the last um, public official uh, update, um, I, I heard from uh, Superintendent uh, Dr. DeBacco, and he's uh, unfortunately in Hartford celebrating the Teacher of the Year Award. Um, passes on his best regards and also uh, thanked uh, the board for responding to his letter, um, which was a request for formation of a school building commission to explore uh, potentially building a new middle school. And uh, that's on the agenda for later tonight, but he, he did want to send on his thanks and his apologies for not coming. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. So that ends the public official session um, and uh, move on to uh, committee reports, finance committee. Anything that hasn't been covered before? We passed a budget. <laughs> couldn't get, couldn't get off you bill. fast enough. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a motion to pay all bills, bills if deemed correct. Sorry. Second. Motion to pay all bills by Mamone, second by Rivers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Um, do we have any other committee reports? Other than the, uh, is there, a, can we get a general motion to accept all the, the uh, reports? Um, we've I've been pushing to get some of the departments to submit reports and they, and they do a good job of uh, every month submitting, um, you know, and, we, and they are in our packet and while they're not on the agenda, um, I'd like to acknowledge those, um, you know, the work that's put, being put in that keep us in the loop as to what's going on. Yes. Yes, yes I'd like to make that motion. Motion by Adamowski to accept all, all re reports in the packet. Second. Second. Second by, who was that? Rivers. Cassetti. Cassetti. Cassetti's yeah. on the screen. We're going to go with Cassetti. He can take it. Yeah, yeah, he can take uh, it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Any opposed or abstaining? Perfect. Motion carries. Um, and let's see here. Um, municipal reports. So we have um, we have the boat recommendations up coming up next. That was in your packet as well from the May second meeting. Motion to accept the boat uh, report. So move. Uh, motion by Cassetti. Second. Second. Second by Rivers. All in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Abstaining. <clears throat> Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, tax collector's report and request for refunds. Make a motion to accept the tax collector's report. The refund report is separate, by the way. Yeah, so uh, tax collector report by Mamone. Second. Second by Tar. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extensions? All right, motion carries. And then the yes, right. I, I just had a comment on the tax collectors report. Sure. Um, this was a very extensive uh, report. Yes. Um, and I, I think it follows a series of months where there was no report. Um, I, I think something at this level uh, of detail and comprehensiveness uh, is appropriate every six months, perhaps, uh, annually, perhaps. Uh, but it, it would it would appear that uh, that monthly, um, you know, is a would be a very heavy lift re relative to the uh, <clears throat> other responsibilities of the uh, office. So I, I just wanted to make that 
comment and observation and um, also commend the tax collector on uh, such a comprehensive, understandable, uh, actionable report. Too much data for you, Steve? No, it was uh, it was it was wonderful data, but I, I'm also cognizant of how wow. much time it takes to uh, compile all that. Yeah, uh... Carry on. No, I, I understood <laughs> you. I was just giving you a hard time. Um, th and thank you for your comments, by the way. Um, all right. Uh, next up is the request for refunds um, for m the May 2022. Awesome. And the refund is in the amount of uh, thirteen thousand one forty one and twenty two cents. Motion. Motion. Second. Second by Tar. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries unanimously. Hey, Bob K. Put your mute on. Uh, access and claims. We have one. Um, we have one claim number zero five two two one zero three one. I make a motion mm -hmm. to refer that to our council. Second. Motion to refer to council by Alderman Rivers. Second uh, by Alderwoman Tar. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? All right. Um, pass that on. We have no communications. We have no resignations. Uh, we have one resolution. Um, which was mentioned at the beginning of the meeting by one of the speakers. Let me find it. This was a resolution uh, about the Silver Silverberg uh, Championship Belt. Um, mm -hmm. Storage and display of championship belt resolution, the Ansonia Board of Aldermen that, that hereby resolves and is honored to accept the terms attached and conditions set forth in the proposal of Ronald Silverberg concerning the city of Ansonia's display of his father's 1927 Pinky Silverberg World Championship belt, boxing belt. Further, it's resolved that the championship belt be permanently displayed in the Ansonia Public Library so that our residents can enjoy and learn about this wonderful accomplishment. The Ansonia Board of Aldermen is proud to be part of this historical event. Pinky Silverberg's achievement will be kept alive through the display. So we have a motion to accept this resolution. So yeah. moved. Motion. Motion by Cassetti. Do we have a second? Second. Second, second by Mamone. All in favor? I have two questions. Uh, Can I have discussion oh, oh. quick? Yeah, points of discussion. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to ask two questions and get clarification. One is, um, is there insurance or anything just to clarify whether we're taking possession of somebody else's property? So I just want to make sure that we're covered in terms of insurance. And secondarily, is that I reading that it was displayed in the public library i thought i heard a comment earlier that it may be displayed somewhere other than the library so i just want to clarify whether or not that needs clarification um in the resolution itself yeah, i think i think i can address both of those um it does say the Ansonia public library and i know the speaker uh, mr silverberg stated uh city hall i think he's afraid that the mayor might wear it around town so they decided to go <laughs> with the library instead um but I had only ever heard the library until tonight, but uh, we can check on that. It, the point was it was gonna be publicly displayed in the city somewhere uh, that people could see it. And second, um, quite the first question you had, the second page of that, the resolution that was sent out uh, actually has the terms of that agreement um, that, that basically we would, um, and Kurt um, still here, he could speak to this, but um, it, it has the uh, um, valued amount and also the terms as to uh, whether the Silverberg family at any point, Mr. Uh, Ronald or his children ever want to, to uh, take it back, they can. Um, and then the estimated cost, I they believe was $15,000 was the, the value. Um, but uh, Kurt, can you speak to that as far as the, uh, it is in the second page of the, uh, uh, of the resolution when it was sent out to us. Oh yes, in my conversations uh, with Mr. Silverberg, we talked about um, how essentially how the transaction would go that they were uh, wanted to donate the uh, the belt to the city uh, but if there was ever a time that the family wanted the belt back obviously the city would return the belt to them without question and the uh, belt itself as mentioned has a value of fifteen thousand dollars that if something were to happen to the belt that we would uh, repay the family the fifteen thousand dollars so what we're going to do is we're going to designate $15,000 of the fund balance 
and we'll just earmark uh, championship belt there. I don't know the term we'll use. We'll talk with uh, our auditor on that. And then that's how we will have that money available. Should something happen, uh, we'll have that money put aside. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Mr. Mr. President, does that, does that I guess, hearing that, knowing that it's going to be displayed in the public library, should we just indicate and modify the resolution to indicate displayed within the city of Ansonia as opposed to just the library? No, I think it's supposed to be in the library. Um, okay. Mr. President, we had uh, some preliminary discussions and went back and forth on what the appropriate place would be. And we figured that the, uh, the library is the best uh, because it's the most secure and also uh, the maximum amount of views, um, making it an attraction um, for young and old to be able to view it in the library. City Hall, of course, is sometimes just reserved for business and the library tends to get a broader amount of, uh, of uh, visitors. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we have a, a motion in a second. Is there, are there any other comments or questions on this? You know, I brought the belt with me tonight because I, I assumed the meeting was gonna be in person. I, I, I'll hold it up because it's a very uh, different type of belt than you see today. I'll move back. This is what a 95 year old world championship belt looks like. Wow. That's really cool. That is cool. And that's that's obviously what will be on display for all the, the citizens of Ansonia and, and of the Valley for that matter. It's beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Silverberg. Yeah. Nice to see you again. I saw you at the uh, uh, the naming of the street um, across yes. the road ready as well. And uh, it's, it's great to, to, uh, to have uh, hometown heroes and also to most importantly to celebrate them um forever so thank you again for for your willingness to share that with us it's a very unique belt for sure yep. um all right so did we vote on that no okay so we have a motion in a second all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed <clears throat> and know that mr silver is watching if you say opposed okay any abstentions all right motion carries unanimously congrats and thank you thank you all right, moving on. Um, we have lost my agenda here. Appointments. Next up is uh, appointments. You got two letters uh, from the mayor, and then you got two updated. Um, so just know that you're on both of them, are, say amended at the top. Uh, we'll start with the one that's the school building commission. Um, May 9th, uh, dated May 9th, Board of Aldermen. Pursuant to my powers under the city charter and code, I submit the following appointments, school building commission, two year terms. And I'll note that we, um, that there was a school building commission that timed out, I think in 2019, and that, that information's on the website. So there hasn't been anything in existence um, since that point. And there actually hasn't been any school building um, going on. Uh, and last month you'll recall that um, Dr. Tobacco submitted a request to us to um, requesting that uh, he can that we form a school building commission to explore particularly the um, uh, the, the prospect of building a middle school uh, for the public school system. So there are about a thousand appointments. Hang on, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Appointments. Mr. President, can I just make a quick? Do we need to first make a motion to establish the school building committee? Right. Or is that done already? I, I believe we did that. Um, I thought we did it last, yeah, last week. week. Yeah, I think we, we established week. the commit committee and then we we'll keep meeting next month with the with the appointments. That's themselves. right. Perfect. Okay. So well, 12 uh, nominees. Um, I don't know how you guys want to handle this. As a group. All at once. Uh, As a group, I would hope. Can I can I read the name? And then we does anyone have any issues with people other than myself? I you can certainly vote against me, but um, I would like to, read the name, I'd like to read the names and the address, and then uh, maybe we can vote as a block if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's All fine. Right. Uh, School Building Commission, uh, Joshua Short, uh, 119 Prindle Ave, Joseph Yauman, 183 Wakeley Ave, Steve Adamowski, 50 North State Street. And I'll note that um, the charter is very specific in. The composition, it's uh, some aldermen, it's uh, boat members, it's members of the public, and it's board of, uh, board of ed members. 
So that's what this is. Uh, so the first three of the aldermen, uh, Gary Cassetti, 102 Route Ave, David Papson, 16 Chester Street, Anthony Levinsky, 3 Hoinsky Way, Rich Bashara, 20 Sobin Drive, Elizabeth LaBerge, 2 Myrtle Ave, Tracy DeLibro, 31 Martin Terrace, Larry Bummels, 4 Renahan Drive, Bobby Evans, 2 Glen Ridge Drive, and Gary Farrar Jr., 14 Kathy Lane. Move. Second. Uh, motion to accept um, to a point by Rivers. Who was the seconder on that? Me. Um, I'm on. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions. I'll abstain from myself. I'll abstain from myself as well. And I'll abstain from myself. All right. And I'm going to vote no against Yaman. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to say that. Um, uh, all right. Josh and Steph, I just want to point out um, Beth LaBerge has a different address, so I'll just adjust that when I send the letter of appointment. Yes, I, did. I saw that tonight. Someone sent that to me, but it was after this was in. So thank you okay. for checking that. Yep. Okay. Um, I didn't get rid of it. I need it. Perfect. Um, School Building Commission. Let's see. Okay, so then you have letter number two. Just trying to find it. Got so many papers here. Uh, we have two different um, committees. Again, uh, pursuant to my powers under the city char uh, charter and code, I hereby submit the following appointments. Uh, the first one is the Ans uh, Ansonia Opera House Committee, uh, two-year terms. This is a new, never having existed um, committee. Um, and there are two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven 10, um, 11 nominees by the mayor. How do we want to handle this? A block. Same way. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll read the names. Um, Joshua Schuert, 119 Prindle Ave, uh, Joseph Gennetti, 2 Gracie Lane, Joseph Cassetti, 72 Root Ave, Apartment 2, Gary Farrar Jr., 14 Kathy Lane, Walt. Konzerski, 185 Maple Street, uh, Seymour, Connecticut. Anthony Mullen, 420 Roosevelt Drive, uh, Derby, Connecticut. Patrick Buckley, 118 Dickinson Drive, Shelton, Connecticut. Kathleen Kylie Fisher, 89 Wickham Road, Glastonbury. Joey Phoebus, 275 Quorum Ave, uh, Shelton, Connecticut. Jennifer Rose, 66 Todd's Hill Road. Branford, Connecticut, Katie Hoy, 269 Bellevue Ave, West Haven, Connecticut. Make that motion to accept those nominees. Motion, second. motion by Mamone, second by Rivers. All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? And abstentions, I'm assuming from myself, Joe. Aye. Yep. Joe Gennetti and Cassetti on themselves. All right, and then the third um, set is uh, Cultural Commission, three year terms. Um, Joey Phoebus, uh, 275 Quorum Ave, and Anthony Mullen, 420 Roosevelt Drive. Um, those are new appointments. Make a motion to accept those appointments. Second. Motion by Moan, second by Adamowski. All in favor? Uh, uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion Josh, there. just a note on that for uh, for those who haven't seen um, the photography work of Mr. Mullen. He does fantastic work for the city. You know, he's taken a lot of pictures of the Opera House and stuff like that. So for those online or, um, you know, on Facebook, he does publish an assortment of his pictures. So he's super talented and, you know, has a lot of perspective I think that wasn't even possible from uh, from a camera so he does fantastic work check it out yeah and I, I would further note that um, some of those names that you see um, are the people that kind of jump started um, talks on the uh, opera house um, and have already been working as you said culturally and around the city so um, uh, super they're super talented team yeah we'll take uh, we'll take all the help we can get so. <laughs> um, all right moving on we have no ordinances, and then uh, we have new business. We have uh, three items under new business. First item is transfer station fees. Uh, this was put on here by Kurt. So I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Miller to discuss this. 
Uh, yes. So um, in my capacity as um, as in assisting Public Works uh, till we find a new director, um, one of the things I had some conversations with uh, Mike uh, D'Alessio outgoing was the desire to uh, finally institute the transfer station fees. Um, so we are in the process now of updating those fees. Uh, Rich Bashar has been uh, looking around to uh, surrounding communities to get an idea of what's being charged. Um, we're going to put together a uh, updated list of fees um, and we will uh, alert you to those and then we will put those out uh, in the appropriate time. So one of the things that we're going to need to uh, just take a quick look at is the debit card machine uh, or the machine that we use for plastic. Uh, it's my understanding that it needs to be run twice if uh, someone were to pay by a credit card. So we need to just make the updates on that. Uh, but we're just in the, uh, the beginning stages of this. Uh, so I expect to have an update for you uh, and have things ready to go by the next meeting. Um, yeah, I have a... Um... The next when? Sorry, I, that, that cut off at the end, Kurt. The next when? Next, by the next meeting. Okay. Yep. Um, last time we discussed this was almost, uh, I don't know, two years ago. We had already um, voted on the fees and everything. Um, yep. All we were waiting on then was to get the um, the uh, machine to take a uh, card. No, we, we have the machine, Chicago. Now we have the machine, but when we started this, we didn't have the machine. No, two years ago when we voted, the machine was put in somewhere, you know, somewhere within that time, shortly thereafter when oh, we yeah, voted. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I guess I'm a bit disappointed this never got off the ground, you know, based on the vote, the fee schedule, everything else that we set forward when we talked about it. So, Kurt, you know, I look, I look forward to you bringing this to, to, to resolution and to, you know, implementation because it's been a, a long time coming. And like I said, we, we voted on it. We had the fee schedule. We had everything all set up and designed and ready to go. And it just kind of fell on the floor somewhere. So. And one other comment, um, Kurt, is that I understand that you're going to that, that fee schedule has to come back to us for a revision. Is that my, is that correct? Uh, yeah. If we make changes to it, uh, okay. it needs to be voted on by you. If, if there are no changes made, um, then I would assume the original one that you voted right. uh, would still be in force. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So the next item under new business, um, Sheila put this on, 824 referral of requests to planning and zoning. And there's three streets listed on there. Would you like to speak to this? Uh, yes. And I think John also wants to talk about it. Um, Two Elm Street is the first property location, and that's the former police station. Um, we are interested in potentially putting that out to bid, although um, another department may be interested in it. Uh, we're just hearing of that. So um, this gives us the, the ability to uh, put that property out to bid if the city so chooses to do so. So that's two Elm. Um, John, you want to take the um, Lester and High streets, or do you want me to? Okay, you can go. I'll so uh, Lester Street and High Street are two lots that the city, uh, you know, um, had some um, foresight in in reserving because uh, we knew at one point the Olson Drive. Um, development would occur and that parking would be a premium and so um, we are looking to uh, potentially sell those parcels or uh, make some transaction for uh, the Olson Drive development as they are adjacent. The aim and is to make sure um and again, this will be part of the overall conversation, but to ensure that access and parking issues are taken into account with any development. We have three, we have a request from, from the city for us to um, send these three streets, um, these three uh, sites for 824 referrals from P and Z. Um, and if, and you can, I'm sorry, uh, Alderman Rivers, and you can also vote on 824 referral pending 
for um, zoning approval? You know, traditionally, Is that right? It's, it's traditionally, it's sending it to PZ for right. the 824 referral, right. and then that recommendation will come back to you at your next meeting. Oh, sorry. Okay, oh. sorry, guys. Okay, um, I have um, a question about the um, the six Lester Street and the uh, 58 High. Now, um, is that going to be owned by the city for the uh, parking? Possibly. That's actually a very good question. We could own it and lease it, or we could sell it. it it's all about, you know, obviously the city you know, doesn't want to put itself into a position where it needs to pay for the improvements um, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, so I think that um, Alderman Rivers, uh, that option is definitely one of the options on the table. Um, the other option is to include it in the sale. Um, it's all subject to negotiation and what makes the most sense. I think there's a pros and cons, you know, to either situation. Um, but, um, you know, we see that as integral to the overall development here. And again, parking and access, you know, to make sure this development flows well with the surrounding area. That's right. the reason that these pieces need to be in play. Okay. But that's a very good, I think that's definitely one of the two ways to go here. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Can I ask you a quick question? Sorry, I don't know if I was like micro sleeping or something. Who currently owns those properties? City. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, I missed that. Okay, I'm up to speed. He has acquired them over the past several years um, and understood that they were pretty strategically necessary to do dovetail with whatever happened at Olson Drive. Um, and now they're they're coming into play. We do need the permission of uh, planning and zoning and then through planning and zonings referral this board in order to put them on the table properly. All right, I'm going to do Chicago dirty. Can I make a motion to send... <laughs> Oh, that's so mean, Tony. The three properties, that's... 2 Elm Street, 6 Leicester Street, and 58 High Street, 2 Planning and Zoning, 4 and 824 referral. With my I'll... apologies to Mr. Hang on one second. No, no, that's all right. I'll Tony, I, ha I have a question. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about 6, I, uh, six Leicester Street. Okay. I am, uh, if I recall, 6 Lester had a house on it and the house came down because of a drainage problem underneath it. I don't know what has been remedied there other than taking the house that was falling down away. Uh, are we going to be liable or should that just be kept mm -hmm. as an open lot? It would likely be parking, okay. Bobby, but that's a good question. And in addition, the um, the developer for Olson Drive is going to be seeking an easement to make some changes to the drainage system on that portion of the property that abuts Leicester Street. So um, okay. that'll all I just be didn't want to be discussion. responsible. Yep. <laughs> I didn't want to be responsible for 20 cars falling in a sinkhole. There. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Are we going to still blame you anyway? Is yes. Your yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, we are. At least, right. Bob, at least Bob warned you. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion by Mamone. Do we have a second? Yeah, it was by me. Second by Rivers. Uh, any other discussion on this? No. All right, motion and a second to refer to PMZ all three streets. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? All right, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thanks for the explanations on that. All right, next up under new business, we have uh, deep grant discussions, uh, NV COG and deep. And I see uh, John DiCarlo is here as well as uh, potentially some guests. Can you give a short presentation to us? Sure. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Board President. Good evening, everyone. I'm John DiCarlo. I'm Municipal Shared Services Director for Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments. On the call with me is Christine O'Neill, who's an environmental planner with NVCOG, and Kristen Brown, who is a consultant with Waste Zero, who's been working with both DEP and NVCOG in the programming I'm gonna uh, frame before you right now. There was a memo in your packets outlining what I'm gonna frame, uh, but um, basically, as a lot of you know, towns and cities face a solid waste crisis. Capacity is a major issue. Mira closing its facility exacerbates an already Poor environment, uh, tipping fees are projected to skyrocket statewide. 
NVCOG mayors and first selectmen implored staff to uh, work on this on their behalf. We formed a working group which has focused our efforts on opportunities available through the grant program that DEEP unveiled last summer. The program is allows towns and cities to explore opportunities that could lead to reducing tipping fees in the future. There is a pool of $5 million statewide. Eight NVCOG communities, as well as NVCOG itself, uh, put in an ask from that pot for more than a million dollars. NVCOG would be doing outreach and education on behalf of the towns and cities. Because we're very familiar with your towns and cities, we would be doing the outreach in conjunction with the city on behalf of to explain the pilot program. So uh, the pilot programs are organics diversion where organics would be sent to an anaerobic digester combined with unit-based pricing within the, which in the pilot year ask residents to voluntarily bag their waste into color-coded bags that are provided. There's no cost to residents. Um, they're provided for free. There's no penalty if the residents choose not to participate. We're certain that enough people will voluntarily participate in this to prove whether the approach will work for the city. And before I turn it over to Kristen, I'll mention something that when you're explaining this program to your residents, uh, any town of city officials and uh, aldermen, we're exploring this because DEP is providing the funds this year for the city. It's a really excellent opportunity to do this without any cost to the city. If it works for the city and it works for your residents, this is something you could go forward with. If it doesn't work for the city and it doesn't work for your residents, you may say that was enough, we've tried it and we're not gonna do it anymore, but it's important to know that's the basis behind the pilot program. Uh, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Kristen to explain a little bit more. Uh, so thank you, John. And I think that Chris Nelson um, just joined us as well and he's from DEP. Is he on? I'm on. Okay. I'll let <laughs> Chris give a little introduction first and then I'll share my screen really quick and show you some photos and um, graphs. <laughs> Go Thanks, ahead. Kristen. And, and John actually covered some of my speaking points. So some of my work is done. I'll just provide a little more background. As, as John mentioned, Connecticut's facing a bit of a waste crisis with a loss of disposal capacity, which will impact and continue to impact tipping fees going down the road. Um, I wanna pro provide some context. Uh, we currently are in the, in the midst of what we're calling the Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management Initiative or CCSMM. Uh, this dates back several years and we were hearing, DEEP was hearing from a number of towns concerned about the, you know, the future of Connecticut's waste disposal capacity and, and where stuff will go as waste energy facilities like the one in Hartford shut down. So um, after hearing from a number of towns, the, the deep commissioner, along with some of the leading towns from cost and CCM, they formed the CC, CCSMM um, initiative in 2020. Uh, 96 Connecticut towns, including Ansoni, are currently signed on to this process. Uh, a CCSMM menu of options was finalized in early 2021, um, and the adoption of unit-based pricing programs for trash and the diversion of food scraps from trash were two of the major policies highlighted in that menu to reduce the amount of waste uh, generated in the state, uh, which leads to the formation of the grant program that you're considering today. Uh, in the last legislative session in 2021, DEEP was given $5 million to implement a municipal grant program. Uh, the, the grants were um, you know, for towns as well as regional entities like COGS. Uh, and NV COG has been a very active partner in a lot of this work and it's been great to see them um, really working on behalf of their towns to get some of these pilots going. Um, and the, the grant program was really designed to uh, promote programs that would substantial or significantly reduce the amount of waste that, were, that was being generated and sent for disposal in Connecticut. Um, well, we've talked about having programs that look at or, organics diversion and or unit-based pricing. Deep strongly believes that programs that utilize both of those options have the highest, will have the highest amount of success. Um, Deep is also looking, uh, you know, a focus on projects that will have a pathway to permanence after the, after the initial pilot phase. So we want to look at uh, projects that we think have a decent likelihood of being adopted as a full-time policy going down the road. Um, the grant process is underway, has been very competitive to date. I think we ended up with over 30 applications. 
Uh, May 9th was the deadline for applications. So at least for this first phase, um, we have all the applications in that are coming in and Sony is one of those. Um, as you know, many towns are interested in trying out variations of this, uh, what we call the Meriden model, which focuses on the co-collection of bag food scrap and bag trash. Um, what happens is in the trash bin, the, the bag trash and the bag organics go into the same bin and they get sorted out at the facility after collection. Uh, the food scrap goes to facilities that can recycle it. And then the, the, the reduced amount re, uh, remaining trash goes for disposal. Um, and just, uh, you know, we deep has heard some detractors to this program making claims that co collection doesn't work because the bags break when compacted in the collection vehicles. But based on what we've been seeing from the Meriden pilot so far, bag, bra I'm sorry, bag breakage has not been an issue. So uh, from our perspective, it's been very successful so far. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. President, Board of Aldermen, thank you for having me tonight. I know it's late and so I'll be pretty quick, but I would love to share my screen here. Perfect. Um, because let's see, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep, um, yeah, so a few, I'm just going to go through a few slides just that have some photos as well as some graphics just to get kind of everyone on the same page. As Chris Nelson mentioned, um, Ansonia did apply for the grant. Um, Chris and both John talked about uh, sort of a waste crisis and um, I've been a, in, in waste management for over 32 years. Uh, the, this, it, it has been, you know, coming since I started, uh, you know, my career, but now it is really, um, there really has been a change in landscape. We had 6,000 landfills across the U.S. 30 years ago. Today, we have just over a thousand. Um, they're closing, you know, at, at a really fast pace. Uh, the reason is because they're full and it's really hard to get another or site another landfill um, in a, you um, in, in, in a town, as you can imagine, if you wanted to put a landfill in your town, you know, people wouldn't want it. So it is really difficult to find new disposal sites. Uh, so they're closing faster than we're finding new ones. And this is across the US, it's not just in New England. Um, it's particularly difficult in New England. Uh, we also have had 85 incinerators um, or waste energy facilities, which you have five of uh, in the US. We're down to about 75 of those today. Uh, the average incinerator has about a 30 year really good life before it starts to have, uh, you know, mechanical breakdowns and, um, you know, uh, processing issues. So all of the waste energy facilities in the US other than one is about is over 32 years old. So as long as I've been in waste, um, the, that's the age of the incinerator. So we really are losing capacity and that capacity loss is causing um, you know, higher prices. So every state, in fact, every country around the, the world is really looking at better ways to manage materials. And as Chris mentioned, one of those ways is pulling the food waste out of the waste stream because food waste can be turned into biogas, um, which can be used to create energy. Uh, so it's important to really think about our materials differently uh, as we begin to really run out of space to dispose of them across the US, not to mention because of costs. Uh, Sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, so uh, as, as Chris mentioned as well, there are two really key initiatives that can reduce trash. One of them is called unit-based pricing, also known as pay-as-you-throw. And the other one is, is collecting your food scraps and diverting them out of the waste stream. Uh, unit-based pricing and food scraps together, as Chris mentioned as well, it, it is, is a really important pathway forward. Uh, this is just looking at per capita disposal. So across the U.S., in 1990, we threw away 900 pounds per person per year. Today, in Connecticut, and basically the same across the US, we throw away about 740 pounds per person per year. Um, there are around 2,000 communities out of 35,000 in the United States that have something called unit-based pricing or pay-as-you-throw. Those communities throw away about 50% less material. So Stonington is a unit-based pricing program. They are um, one of two that you have in 
the state of Connecticut. So you can see the average um, per capita is three four, or 740. The average in Stonington is about 386 pounds per capita. So when the, the unit-based pricing concept is really important, it really does make a difference in work. Uh, if you couple unit-based pricing with a curbside food waste collection program, you get down to around 220 pounds per capita. Um, and these numbers are really important when you think about maybe five years ago, you were probably paying $80 a ton for your trash. Today, you're around close, getting close to 110. Mir projects that by 2025, 26, we'll be at 140 a ton. I can tell you that on the West Coast, you're over 200 a ton. Um, to throw away trash. So the, the cost is escalating at a really, really rapid rate. Um, the idea behind unit-based pricing is basically shifting a little bit of the cost of trash to the user. Right now, in most communities across the United States, trash is paid for in the tax base. Um, but that was acceptable when the cost of trash wasn't as expensive. But as the trash, the cost of trash continues to elevate, the concept of unit-based pricing means you shift a little bit of that cost not necessarily all of that cost, but a little bit of that cost to the user so that the user thinks twice about throwing things away. Kristen, um, can I just ask a quick, a quick clarifying question? Can you just verify that although you're talking about how UBP proper works with shifting the cost to the user, for this pilot program, the cost gets shifted entirely to the grant, is that correct? Yeah, so the cost gets okay. shifted to the grant. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to go through unit-based pricing first. But okay, sure, sure. I just wanted to make that clear, um, thank you. Yeah, for sure. I'll explain how it's going to work in the grant, but just to get you on the same page with what it is, um, the 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 idea of shifting a little. So, for instance, in the town of Stonington, residents use yellow trash bags that are required um, for disposal. Those yellow trash bags say the town of Stonington, and when you purchase those trash bags at your regular grocery stores or CVS or wherever you purchase your bags, those bags are available. You use the Stone Engine trash bag. And when you purchase that bag, um, you're paying for the bag itself and also a little bit of your disposal cost. Um, so for instance, you could, if a bag, if a trash bag costs 30 cents for the bag itself, you might charge 50 cents or 80 cents or a dollar. Um, different communities do it in different ways. Again, there are about 2000 unit based pricing programs across the US. So, so the way that you charge is, is completely up to you. And as Christine mentioned, to get you started on this, the concept is more, um, more about helping residents become accustomed to the concept, um, not necessarily as much about charging for the bags. Uh, so in this next um, you know, graphic there, um, I'm using Brattleboro, Vermont as an example. They're one of the towns that has both unit-based pricing and curbside food waste collection. Again, we think you're going to get down to about 200 pounds per capita. That makes a giant difference if your tip fees you know, double over the next you know, five to six years. Just, just to interrupt for a second, Kristen, I think we've, we've thrown a lot of information uh, to the Haldermen uh, in a short amount of time. I know where time is late to. If we can take any questions, I think it would be really helpful right now to take questions from uh, from the board. And then we, if there's extra time, we can kind of explain as well. But we're happy to take questions. We have thrown a lot of information at you in a short amount of time, and we want to give plenty of time to answer any questions. Or do you want me to kind of explain the pilot quickly so that they can kind of visualize it first? Or uh, can I? Yeah, that would, can I, I think that would have been. I, was oh, say, I think that would have been helpful up front because there's a lot of information here, and I think. You know, I'm not quite sure you're mentioning food waste in a separate bag and a charge like yeah what so exactly that, are you setting up here like what is this let's, yeah so let's just kind of keep moving through so so this is the pilot that's happening in Meredith um, there are as Chris mentioned about 28 other communities that have also applied um, to do something similar and the concept is pretty easy um, in the Meriden pilot and this would be a pilot that would go for one year in your town to all homes that currently get um, the curbside collection of trash. Um, the, each home would receive two garbage bags, which are orange that say trash um, for, for, at no cost. Um, and each home would receive a food waste bag. The orange garbage bags are typical tall kitchen trash bags that you put over you know, in, in your container that you typically have in your kitchen. Um, the food scrap bags are a little bit smaller. They're eight gallon bags, and those um, fit over basically a five gallon bucket. Um, part of the grant funds, do, we do have buckets available for people who might want to keep one of those under their counter to be able to close it. Um, and the idea is simply at home, when you're cleaning off food scraps and cleaning out, you know, cleaning out to-go boxes out of your refrigerator, the food goes in the food bag and the rest of the trash goes in the trash bag and the recycling continues to go in the recycling bin 
you know, where it, where it typically goes. So there's no change in the recycling behavior. It's just a matter of what we call co-collecting the food and the trash. So the, the trash is in orange, the food is in green. Um, when the, after the trash is collected, it's, it's put into the same trash truck, it's compacted just like normal. And your current collector, one of the reasons that you're an ideal community for this pilot is because your current collector and, and um, disposal facility is country disposal in Wallingford and country disposal is actually has a semi automated system that they've put together in order to accommodate all of the pilots across the state. Um, so that's why for you, it's, it's actually a really good fit because you're already going there. Um, but basically residents change is that they're going to now have these orange and green bags and they're going to be asked to separate. If they don't want to separate their food, they don't have to. But interestingly, what we found in the, in the Meriden pilot is people like doing it. So once you get going on it, they, they do like it and it will make a, a big difference in your disposal. Um, so that's, that's basically what it looks like. This is a little bit um, this gives you a little Person, bit. Can I, can I jump in for a second? Um, and I apologize because um, John had mentioned that uh, materials were in our packet. And I don't think any of the aldermen received any of this stuff before the meeting. And, no. and then you're, and oh. now we've got like 20 minutes of more material. Uh, I think it would be I apologize for that, Mr. President. I thought it was something that would be distributed, but yeah. I think I think it was sent, but it never got into, into the packet. So I'd say other than um, maybe one or two people, like no one's seen this. Um, so this is the so that's why there were some questions. But I think that our best course of action would be to get all those materials and I'll make sure everyone gets them and then we follow up with you on questions. Uh, definitely intriguing, obviously. Um, but yeah. I don't want I don't want to have like a a super long presentation and then we still are just going to punt it because we don't have the material you know they're going to want to see the materials up front uh, so, yeah I, I can email everyone this um little deck and then also what we could do is i'm happy to set up some small sort of small group meetings if you want to go through it because it's it's really the idea is 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 the pilot allows you to get a little bit of data on waste reduction. It allows all the residents to give this a try. Um, and it allows you to get a lot of feedback from your residents. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to go through in more detail in smaller groups if you want to. So, it, you know, because it, I, I, it is complicated, um, but as much as it's complicated, it's actually relatively simple. And what, what we do find is the residents do like it. So. Um, yeah, and then and thank you, Kristen, and thank you, uh... Josh as well on this. Yeah, we're, we're basically at the stage now where uh, DEP just wants to make sure that everyone is aware of what we're applying for, that if there's buy-in at the city level, which we, we're aware there is. We're happy to speak further uh, to the board and, and uh, we will make sure that the board gets the memo that Christine sent out uh, a couple of week, a week or so ago on this one. Uh, happy to, we're happy to take any questions at any time. I know there's also a couple uh, members of the media in the call, happy to take questions. Uh, at my line in my office, I, I and uh, Christine in my office are happy to speak with the media anytime on this. Yes, yeah, awesome. so this is just a, a picture of the Meriden pilot, the orange trash bags, the green food bags, just to give you a little bit more visual. This is the one of the sorters moving the bags. Yeah, so so this is uh, kind this, of what it looks this, like, and the idea is, you know, just to, to get- One the question I have, I have one question. Once the pilot money is gone, um, where do that money come from to buy the bags? It so, comes. Yeah. So, so what the way that the pilot works is you you gather you gather information and data. One, the data it tells you how much did your trash reduce, how much therefore is that going to save you at the city level. Um, you get feedback from residents as to do they like this concept? Would they keep doing it? Um, you know, if if it had a cost. So the the. The price of the bags themselves can be priced really any way that you want. A typical household uses about $4 worth of bags a month. In this particular um, program, they're gonna use less bags because you're gonna wanna charge a little bit more than a typical trash bag. Um, and then the, the overage goes to the city. So if, you, if a bag costs 30 cents, typically you're gonna be charging anywhere from 40 cents to 80 cents. Um, 80 cents is going to cover all of your tipping fees um, so that you're, it's kind of like a prepaid phone. They're paying for their bag, they're covering the tip fee and the bag itself. 
Um, if you were down in the 45 cent range, you're just covering a little bit of your tipping fees, but this provides an incentive for residents to change, you know, to think twice about everything they throw away. And then it also allows you to pull the food waste out because by, by using a specific, you know, specced, specified bag, um, the waste bags don't break. And so as Chris Nelson was mentioning, that's a part of a part of this pilot, this initial pilot, was to make sure if residents do do this and they do it correctly, does the food stay separated from the trash? Um, so it's important to have a food bag and a, and a trash bag so residents, um, so that the food can actually be pulled out of the waste stream, which is about 22% of your waste stream, and it can then go to anaerobic digestion or composting. Either one is, is significantly lower in cost than it, it would be to throw the the material away. So shifting that material out of the stream, out of the waste stream and into the into the compost or anaerobic digestion stream is also a savings. I believe that you're in this presentation will show it when you when you get the paperwork, but um, the city would save somewhere between um, 200 and 450 thousand dollars depending on how you price the bags um, and residents themselves would not necessarily spend really any any or much more than they currently spend on regular garbage bags so if you plan it correctly um, with the ability to divert the food waste you can actually create a program that isn't much different than the current program today as far as cost goes but a significant savings to the city thanks Kristen and, and it's a great question Alderman Rivers on that because one, one thing we do stress is that they already pay for trash bags. They would be paying for a different kind of trash bag if when the pilot is over, the city decides to go forward. Thanks, John. And I, uh, okay. well, Josh, I have one quick question just in terms of the, oh. the cost savings that Kristen referenced. Um, is that based on the, the, the company pickup or is that based on the cost of the bags subsidizing um, the use. So I guess my question is twofold really, is that I understand the concept of the bags paying it forward um, for the tipping costs and, and using some of that money to offset those costs. But is there all additional, to, in addition to that, is the waste collection company, because, the, because there's a separation in that the food waste can be actually, I presu presume sold or um, used for a different purpose and has some value to them. Is there a discount in the waste collection at that point? Uh, yeah, so this, this particular projection shows a couple of different scenarios, um, year two through five. So um, if you look at the first line in, in year two scenario, there is a bag revenue of about $100,000. And this is assuming that you're charging, if you go sort of down that column, about 45 cents a trash bag. So you're making about 14 cents a bag, uh, 15 cents a bag the city is bringing in to help offset cost. It also, in this scenario, you're gonna be, get about a $344,000 savings in your tipping. So the waste hauling company doesn't necessarily save money because they're still moving materials around with their trucks, um, but, but you do save in disposal costs. So you no longer have to send that material where it's gonna go okay. now. Out of yeah, the tonnage is less. Right, you're gonna you're you're lowering your tonnage, so you're lowering that disposal cost. Now, if you if you follow line year two down, um, you do have a food tip fee. You know, so you're paying sixty five dollars a ton for food, and probably in this in this year again, I've got it sort of all in one hundred and ten for tipping. So you do you so you're correct in your assumption. You get a little bit of bag revenue, but you do get a lot of saving of tip savings, avoided disposal savings. You get a net savings here of about net to the city of about one hundred ninety-one dollars. Uh, I mean, one hundred one hundred ninety-one thousand. Um, when you get to year five, again, this is projecting tipping fees going up somewhat, um, and sorting fees and processing fees coming down. You're looking at around a, a half a million dollar savings. Again, it's also sort of looking at the cost of your disposal bag going up. Um, these are all things, that's why I suggested maybe small group meetings, because you can really play around with this to form it in a way that best suits you and best suits the residents. The good thing about the pilot is you start to get resident feedback. And I think you will be surprised by the residents that actually, once they get going on it, really, really like it. So wait, we're going to, we're going to stop at this point. Um, because we'd like you to send all this information to us. And then if we want, you know, maybe through John, going to organize, uh, as you mentioned, maybe some smaller groups uh, with the interested, interested parties. Um, but I feel like with all, you know, all this information and the, not having it um, 
prior, you know, you're just going to keep getting more and more and more questions. But uh, right. I want to thank you guys for coming because I know it's, it's an undertaking to get whatever you have five or six people here um, all in one spot at the same time. So I do appreciate it. I appreciate the efforts um, in explaining the program. If you can get us the full um, deck um, and then we can take it from there. Um, Sure, and, and thank you very much, Josh, and thank you everyone for hearing us out. I think Christine's memo that we'll send out first um, really succinctly lays everything out for everybody and what we're gonna do, and we'll, we'll take questions anytime. NVCOG works for the city of Ansonia. Please don't anyone hesitate to give us a call at any time. We work for the city and we'll take your calls as quickly as possible with any questions. So thank you very much for the time. Awesome, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Welcome. All right. Um, next up, we have um, old business. Um, do we have any old business? Hey, Mr. President, I have something to add. Yes. To the agenda. We have neglected to mention an 824 referral that we need. So I just need to add a motion to add to the agenda, 824 referral, Ray uh, SHW. And I'll explain if you could just make a motion to add that. Okay. I'll make that motion. Motion Back to up. add. Uh, 824 for H SHW by Mamone and a second by Rivers. All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, go ahead, John. Okay, so this is significant news. Um, so we're happy to report that SHW, which is, of course, that piece of the overall copper and brass feral facility downtown um, that is owned by the city, it's um, getting underway for demolition and remediation. And we're at that point where in order to really move things along and get to where we need to be, um, we, we can be greenlit for an RFP to seek a tenant for the property. Um, essentially, we're looking for a tenant to bring jobs and revenue to the city. Um, we're interested certainly in a potential manufacturing use. Um, I think this is a big moment because it allows us to start to unleash further some of the potential of this space. Um, and in order to do, to do so, we do need an 824 recommendation from planning and zoning to have this board actually enter into any uh, lease proposal or, or go out to bid for that sort of use. So we're looking to uh, send that to planning and zoning with the other 824 referrals. John Paul, can you I'll just call move. the, oh, hold, on, hold on, can you call off the address on that, John Paul? I'm sorry. He's frozen, dude. Uh, the address is 35 North Main Street. Thanks, and John it's, Paul. And it's building 12. Okay. Well, it's, it's I'm, whatever. Uh, no, thanks, Sheila. So, no, I, uh, if he's frozen, I make a motion to Are refer you the, again. Yes. 35 <laughs> North Main Street. Thank you, Sheila. 35 North Main Street, building 12. Yes. Two. I mean, it, yeah, you don't have to be specific. I don't think you need building think 12. You just say eight. Okay. 824 for 35. Yep. Send it to uh, planning and zoning for an 824. Second. Right. Well, we already have the first, we already have the second. Um... <laughs> no, he stole it already. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Ramon and Rivers, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Rivers, you're always the second. I uh, know. Yeah. It's a good thing I like Tony. We'll, we'll try to give you adjournment. We'll just like wait a couple seconds so you can. No, no, you don't have to. No, you don't have I'll to. I'll make a motion to go into executive session. There you go, Bobby. Yes, well, we have to vote, vote first. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? All right. Motion carries. Um, that's it. Um, motion to go to executive session by TAR. Um, we have a second. Um, who do you Second. have one in there? Did there put anybody at turn there? So we have one item for executive session, Ben Street Solar pending litigation. Um, All right, so we're going to have John and we're going to John and the Alderman, is it, I'm assuming. And Kurt. Kurt and Sheila too. Okay, that's what I was asking. Okay. Let's go. I'm ready. Hey, John's back. I'm having trouble getting onto my computer. Hold on. Yeah, that's because it's an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> that's it it has worked perfectly fine over the entire uh covid pandemic yeah I how many you had already that. how many times you changed that ipad <laughs> it's not an ipad it's a macbook oh, 
Oh, Hold that's on. even worse. That's a Godzilla stomp. <laughs> means world edition <laughs> motion to come out of the executive session second all in favor. Motion, motion by rivers second by Char. all in favor aye. 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 all right josh i'd like to make a motion to oh. author it well, i was going to say uh we have one item from executive session ben street solar re pending litigation like to make a motion to authorize corporation council to proceed as discussed in executive session second second motion by mamone second by rivers any discussion all in favor uh, aye. Aye. any opposed any abstentions all right motion carries unanimously motion to adjourn motion second. to adjourn. oh look at uh, rivers got in there first look at I that i got it i got it